this evening, we're very lucky indeed to have James Harding here to speak uh, for us. Um, now, James is on the teaching staff of St. Melitus, which is why I was looking over quizzically um, uh, as I was guessing at the numbers of the students who might be here for that keen lecture. Um, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, but James has an interesting background and a uh, particular interest in the book of Revelation and the Christian Brethren. So his title, as you can see, is Ye Men of Plymouth, Why Stand Ye Gazing Into Heaven? The Distinctive Theology of the Brethren Lincoln. James, the stage is yours, and thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here. It's um, about about a year this week since I moved down to Chelmsford with my family to start work at St. Lighters College as their tutor in missiology and mission studies and also to be the curate at a local parish church, Holy Trinity, Springfield and it's great to be able to come and talk to you this evening. I wonder, to start off with, if uh, anyone would hazard a guess at the bit of scripture that's been misquoted in my title. Does it ring any bells? Ye men of Galilee, Acts chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? And does anyone know who corrupted in a humorous way this, uh, this Bible verse to level at the Plymouth Brethren as a little bit of a joke? A local man from Kelvedon around about the same time. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the oh, yes. preachers, was born uh, Baptist. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more in a moment. Well, the history of the Christian Brethren movement, it's a story of a group that, that began with great aims, with the aims of seeking unity, uh, commonality, inclusiveness, it aimed to be a pan-denominational group, a pure church within the wider Christian tradition. But after not many years, it ended up in suspicion, separation, exclusivity, and in sectarian division. And I want to tell you a little bit of that story and for us to see how some distinctive theologies emerged in the telling of that story this evening. Let's start back in 1829 in a room here at 9 Fitzwilliam Square in Dublin in Ireland. Five young men who were all disillusioned with the distance to which their own particular denominations had diverged from the simplicity of the original New Testament church, that early church model of Christianity. They met and they came together and they shared a simple service of Holy Communion together. It was quite radical when you think about the people at the time. We'll look at that a bit more later. You see, they desired to come together and find a simple act of worship, a simple act of communion, uh, regardless of individual denominational affiliations or their traditions and backgrounds. They came from the established Protestant churches and from the Catholic Church, as well as from the many new non-conformist groups and dissenting groups. Some of them were clergy, some were laity, all of them were very well educated, wealthy, upper class Victorians, and we can talk about that more if you like later. And they desired to be ecumenical before the birth of the ecumenical movement. They desired to be non denominational and inclusive of anyone who called themselves Christian. In their sharing of the Lord's Supper at the Lord's table, it was an act of devotion that they believed could transcend the fractured and fragmented churches of their day and bring true Christian unity. And so it was to this shared sentiment of unity that the group opened their doors to break bread to all who would come, regardless of their adherence to any particular creed or doctrinal belief. 
and within only one year, the group had grown in number. They had attracted other like-minded groups who were meeting in homes throughout Dublin, throughout Ireland and England. And as they grew, they started meeting in a public hall in Orangia Street, Dublin, just spitting distance from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Just one year later, uh, Providence Chapel was founded in Plymouth, England. And during those next 10 years, the movement spread geographically out from England's West Country with chapels in, um, in moving into London and into the north of England and into Europe. Chapels, churches were opened in Bristol, Torquay, Bath, in Islington and Tottenham, in Hereford, Stafford, Kendal, Hull, and even in Switzerland and Germany within just a few years. If we skip forward to 1880, around about 50, 60 years after the birth of the movement, 50 years or so from those early beginnings in Dublin, there were believed to be some 750 different congregations or chapels established in the UK. 101 congregations in Canada, 91 congregations in the USA, 189 congregations in Germany, 146 congregations in France, and scattered congregations throughout some 22 other countries. It's worth noting that um, the Brethren were active um, through the work of A.N. Groves, Anthony Norris Groves, in early missionary work to Baghdad, and also in social action work through the work of George Mueller and Dr. Bernardo. And Reverend Publishers in London published some 11 different monthly journals with an estimated readership of 40 to 50,000 people reading about the distinctive emerging doctrines of the Brethren Christian communities. So, I want to look now at three distinctive areas of the Brethren movement from its inception in 1829 through to 1900. Um, that's um, not too a bigger time period, but it's still ambitious. In my own archival research, um, I was telling Edward on the way over that just the bibliography of the material that I covered came to 7,500 words. Um, prolific, <coughs> um, prolific publications. Okay, so here are some of the things we're going to look at. We're going to look at the founding fathers of the movement. Actually, we're just going to look at three significant people in those early years. There are loads and we can talk about some of the other ones later, but I've picked just three for us to look at this evening. We're going to look at some of the theological themes that emerge and how they separate themselves out from the wider Protestant and Christian denominations with which they leave. And finally, we're going to look at schism and sectarianism in those first 50, 60 years or so and see how that is in itself a theological distinctive of the community. So hopefully you're all with me there. I think I'll stop between each one and just um, just ask if anything needs clarifying, but we'll take Q&A at the end, and that'll be good. Okay, so let's look at the Founding Fathers. Okay, the first and most important distinctive, I think, of Brethrenism is found in the influence of these leading figures who were involved in the formation of Brethren doctrine, uh, teaching and leadership. Now, this is an interesting point because the community today, even to this day, will strongly reject any formal ministry or any notion of clergy. But it's clear nonetheless that there has always been, from the very start, some dominant personalities in the movements who've been very influential. And these characters were able to impress their insights onto ordinary members of the movement who looked to them through their sheer personal charisma for guidance and direction. 
Now, it's somewhat paradoxical that a famous Brethren publication by Henry Pickering called Chief Among Brethren, published in 1931, is a comprehensive list of many prominent men who joined the movement, who influenced the movement in its early years. But it's paradoxical that the title places the words chief and brethren next to each other in the title. You see, I think Pickering's publication illustrates that whilst you can have a theological ideal and reject formal authority in the church, reject the clergy laity divide, in practice and in reality, human ambition is the arch foe of egalitarianism and theistic government. Human ambition gets in the way. So it wasn't long until the individual chapels and congregations increasingly looked to their charismatic founders to provide authoritative church government and leadership. You see the paradox there. Now it's something of a tradition um, within the Brethren hagiographies and historical writings to begin, to begin with John Nelson Darby. His dates are there, 1800 to 1882. Darby was the godson of Lord Nelson. He was educated at Trinity College Dublin, where he read law. And later he became an Anglican curate. He was ordained into the Anglican Church and served his curacy in County Wicklow in Ireland. And he was one of the original five that met at 9 Fitzwilliam Square in Dublin. And Darby began to tirelessly preach and spread his message, first of all throughout the UK and then throughout Europe. Uh, lots of stuff coming out from Darby in French. He was involved in the foundation of the first Dublin congregation and the Raleigh Street Chapel in Plymouth and also in congregations in Geneva and Vaux in Switzerland. And his untiring and energetic itinerant preaching tours really responsible in part for the geographical spread of the movement. Believe me, he wrote a lot of stuff. He was a prolific writer. And as such, he had an essential role in developing doctrine through these many publications. Now, the tone of all of his writings, the anti-polemical, anti-establishment polemic of all of his writings, is clear in his very first publication in 1829 on the nature and unity of the church. And that anti-establishment tenor was to flavour everything he wrote since that time. <coughs> and in particular, from quite an early time, and here we hit one of the first theological distinctives, which we'll come back to later. Darby began to develop a doctrine of contamination. A doctrine of contamination. A belief that doctrinal heresy could be transmitted from one believer to another through fellowship if the heretical member wasn't put out of fellowship, the whole community would suffer. And that became a fundamental factor in the ongoing history of the Brethren movement. We'll look at that later as we look at the schism and sectarianism of the movement that followed. Darby's influence uh, was fundamental and lasting to the extent that he became the leader of a movement that denied it had any leader. In fact, he became the leader of a movement that would even deny it was a movement. And his charismatic influence was so significant that it lasted for years beyond his own years and extended well beyond his own particular group, the exclusive brethren of the Derbyite community. Let's look at the second of the three people I've chosen this evening. They're three of my favourite authors. Benjamin Lewis Newton, 1807 to 1899. Um, I have to admit, it's one of my favourites. Um, Newton met Darby in Oxford in 1830, a fellow of Exeter College, a gifted 
academic. Newton was born into the Quaker tradition, but he'd become a practicing Anglican by the time of his early adulthood. A dissenting fire was lit in Newton after hearing his friend and mentor, Henry Bultiel, preach a radical sermon at the University Church on the 6th of February, 1831. During this sermon, Bultiel rejected the authority of the established churches. He resigned dramatically from his curacy and began a career preaching in the non-conformist congregations. Edward, I hope I'm not giving you any ideas. <laughs> Just thinking you don't get sounds like that now. No, no. <laughs> I guess the closest example could be John Sentamu when he cut up his Don Collar on TV um, as, a, um, as, as a protest against McGarvey and Zimbabwe. Now, lots of renewal, to give it a, a modern term, was, was happening in the church in those days. And Newton became repelled by some of the more charismatic practices he saw uh, around him, uh, such as speaking in tongues and the miraculous healings that accompanied many of the new dissenting movements. He was still very conservative. So he returned with Derby to his hometown in Plymouth in 1831. He left Oxford, academia, and his affiliation to the Church of England behind him. And Newton was the first leader of Providence Chapel in Plymouth, which was one of the most flourishing brethren chapels of the time, a testimony and demonstration of his skills and of leadership and his persuasive manner. Now, as far as his influence on doctrinal development is concerned, Newton truly was an intellectual powerhouse. Even after his excommunication from the brethren, and we'll come on to that later, he remained influential because he engaged in a theological censorship of the Christian Witness Journal, a widely read journal in the brethren movement. Newton was indeed one of the movement's most brilliant teachers. I love his work, and he was a prolific writer. Many of his publications still exert an enduring influence today on students in millennialist prophecy uh, through the printing efforts and the dissemination work of Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony Publishers in Chelmsford who, who hold Newton in high regard and um, they, they meet just down the road and in various chapels and discuss um, things that Newton was interested in, uh, things like apostasy and the end times still exerts a strong influence. Um, now, Newton and Darby, those two early driving forces in the Brethren movement, disagreed on almost everything. <laughs> but most notably, it was in their Christological emphases, the emphasis they placed on the person of Christ, the nature of Christ, the work of Christ. Newton place more of an emphasis, it's, it's, it's a time old disagreement, it goes back to Alexandria and Antioch in the early church, it keeps resurfacing, Newton placed more of an emphasis on Christ's humanity, and less of an emphasis on the supernatural, divine element of Christ's existence, he suggested that throughout the whole of Christ's 33 years on earth, he experienced real human suffering, as a consequence of being born fully human, and a Jew, now, he didn't deny that Christ was divine, but he just emphasised his humanity and suffering. What he did argue was that, as a descendant of Adam, although Christ was sinless, Christ was accredited with guilt. Christ was accredited with Eucharist guilt, of Adam's guilt, and could have sinned, could have sinned. Whereas Darby responded by emphasising the divine and sinless nature of Christ, suggesting that if Christ had really been in that position, he himself would be classed as a sinner in need of salvation. And I think the argument's actually more nuanced than that. Um, I think both are probably right when we look at the person and work of Christ. And I think years of ecumenical creeds got to that place, but I think there's personality stuff going on here as well. Um, disagreements continued into all areas of these two early leaders' lives. 
uh, let's look at es ecclesiology and the doctrine of the church, what of the church. Uh, Newton's ecclesiological approach to the Plymouth Street Chapel, Ebbington Street Chapel, it had grown to some 800 members under his leadership. Um, it was that although rejecting um, formal ordination, he required a formal organised structure of ruling elders, pre-arranged primary teachers, preaching from a platform, and a strict order imposed on worship. It was in many ways like the established churches in all but name. Whereas Darby's ecclesiology, in contrast, was much more impulsive, and that's a key word we'll look at later, impulsive ecclesiology. Um, it's supernatural, spiritual, divinely led. You see, for Darby, the church's hopes and promises were all spiritual and heavenly, not earthly and human. Perhaps that's why the early Brethren movement refused to take out pension policies. This led him to develop an impulsive theory of ministry, whereby the service was led entirely by the Holy Spirit rather than by any vicar or elder, whatever name you're going to give them. For the church on earth was far too corrupt to be led by men. Okay, let's move on to the third of our founding fathers. I'm sure I remember from my days in Brethren Sunday School the, um, the poem, Some Have Heroes, I Have Free. Um, um, Kelly, Newton, and JMD, John Nelson Darby, or something like that. They certainly became my heroes during my doctoral research. William Kelly. Um, like Darby, Kelly was a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin. He read classics. He met Darby for the first time in 1845. Significant because it was only a year before the damaging schism of the 1846 exclusive open break. And just a few years before the 1848 Bethesda division. Now I'm going to talk about those schisms and divisions later. But the reason it's significant is because in many ways he came into the Brethren movement untainted by those painful events of earlier years. His skill as a church leader was immense. Within the exclusive movement, he was renowned as a prominent leader. He was the most erudite of Darby's followers. His theological and doctrinal influence was vast. He was a man of deep learning and became the chief interpreter of Darby's theology. Huge list of publications including The Prospect, The Bible Treasury, The Christian Annotator, and, and significantly he collected and edited together almost all of Darby's works, which I, I've, I've got a whole shelf on my, a whole shelf on my bookshelf on Darby's collected works, all brought together by, by Kelly. Yet he penned over 300 commentaries on every book of the Bible, along with numerous other books, pamphlets and tracts, and he translated the New Testament from Greek into English. Now Kelly led the 1881 <coughs> schism, the exclusive Kelly division, and that was the opposing faction to Darby's exclusive division, even though he popularised his teachings. The point there being that Kelly becomes a leader of uh, Brevin Sex bearing his own name. And, and I do want to say I'm not using sect in a disparaging way, I'm using it in a sociological way. Um, you know, it's that idea with, with Sakari of just simply cutting off from something else. Um, I don't uh, place any, um, any, any negative value on that word at all. I'm using it to mean it's simply a group that breaks away from another group. I hold these people in high regard myself. Now, back to Spurgeon, local boy, Essex born Prince of, Prince of Preachers. He remarked, Kelly had a mind made for the universe, but narrowed by Darbyism. <laughs> Kelly, though, was of the opinion that Darby's exegetical foundations were certainly worth building on. And thus he popularised and disseminated Darbyite doctrine to a wide audience through his vast publication record of his own works 
and Derby's collective works. And so he helped maintain and strengthen the Derbyite exclusive brethren group into the 20th century, even though he gave his name to his own group. It's little wonder that Kelly has been labeled the greatest of all exclusives in the uh, historical books about the brethren. And that he was regarded as the second only to Mr. Darby in the knowledge of the truth, but the first in ability to state it clearly, which I find quite amusing. Okay, anyone want to um, ask any questions about clarification on founding fathers? Yes. Can I just ask, do you know if Darby's got any connection with the Quakers of Ironbridge? Around the same sort of time or not. There's, um, <laughs> now, the, 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 there is something in the back of my mind about um, Derby and Ironbridge, but I don't think he had a Quaker background. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. Was Kelly Irish? Or? Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, no, I don't think Newton was Irish. Newton's from the West Country, but Derby and Kelly were Irish. Um, and Kelly's um, main bio biography is subtitled The Irish Sentence Scholar. Could you say what impact do you think the sort of socio-political religious state of Ireland at the time these men were growing up might have had on the way they viewed particularly perhaps Anglican Muslim Catholicism, because it was a very troubled, unhappy, actually deliberately deprived society. Yeah, now I would, I, that's a really good question, it's a big question. Can we do that in the Q&A no, at the end? No. Because, because actually, um, um, in, in the editing of this paper, I've cut out that stuff about wider Victorian philanthropy and the difference mm -hmm. between those who did and didn't have and all that other stuff that was going on in Ireland at the time. Uh, we can talk about um, the Powers Court conferences in Bray, 22 miles south of Dublin. Um, we can talk about uh, Henry Drummond, the banker of the new doctrine, um, and, and that difference between those who had and have not. Because actually the brethren challenged that idea that those who stand gazing to heaven are those that have not, the, the, the ones who have found no amelioration in this life. We're talking, we're talking about the, the elite of society, uh, Lord, Cong uh, Lord Congleton, uh, for instance. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll no, dig into either. that one about the sociological stuff later in the Q&A, if that's OK. Could you comment on the subject of ambition? Because you've highlighted these three you give me to understand that they were individually some were ambitious as opposed to groups looking at them and listening to what they say and being ambitious for them. Yeah. It's, it's a different matter. I just wondered what the character I mean, I mean that, that's, a, that's a, really good, uh, a really good question um, and, and point. And, and I, my, my feeling is because I want to be uh, generous and not sceptical when I approach these authors now is um, I don't think it was their ambition. I think I think people get elevated and I think we're just talking very intelligent, very erudite, very charismatic men who um, who who were elevated by the people around them. I think we're talking about very godly men um, and 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 therefore that leads me to believe from what I know of their characters from reading their work that it was more likely to be the people around them that were elevating them than their own vanity or ambition. But we can't get back to those intentions. Um, and so we can either be sceptically hypothetical or generously hypothetical. Yes? They became elevated because they were so charismatic. What about the next generation? I mean, um, we talk about there shouldn't be any leaders, but in, in practice, you almost can't do without it. So what happens when they move on yeah. or die? Again, I think I'd love to deal with that in a bit more detail in the Q&A at the end. By the time we move into the next generation, uh, C.H. McIntosh, William Trotter, uh, William Trotter was a Yorkshireman and a Methodist minister. McIntosh uh, went to North America. And when we hit, um, and th there's a number of key movement, uh, key things that happen in the next generation that actually, that actually affect what happens 
uh, today in, in, popular, uh, in popular theological circles. Uh, so it's the second generation of popularizers um, who were very important. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll look into that in a bit more detail. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the second uh, the second key area of distinctives, staying in this idea of denominational distinctives, and look at some theological themes that we touched on some already. <coughs> Now, the, the, the theology of the Christian Brethren movement is, in many ways, in general terms, uh, that of the Reformed Protestant tradition. Prime importance is placed upon the authority and adequacy of the Holy Scriptures. The Brethren were moderate Calvinists, acknowledging the irresistible and prevenient grace of God. By that I mean you can't escape it. Um, and God does the first bit of work called sinful humans. Um, they place the utmost importance upon personal justification of the individual believer and the total atonement of those who have been saved, an event following believer's baptism rather than infant baptism. Those from the established Catholics or Anglican traditions were rebaptized after their successions and an ensuing life a purity and holiness was expected to follow baptism. And with regard to many doctrines, the group had much in common with all those dissenting and non-conformist groups that were emerging out of the established churches in the Victorian era, in the 18th and 19th century. For example, the Wesleyan Methodists, the General Baptists, the particular Baptists, any remnants of the Presbyterians and the Independents. However, the Church of England and Roman Catholicism was generally regarded as a corrupt form of Christendom rather than a true church by the group. Which is interesting because many of the early leaders were ex Anglican clergymen. And this is reflected in the polemical style of writing levelled <coughs> towards the established churches. Um, and the brethren are part of my forthcoming book that uh, argues that it's in the book of Revelation in particular that the brethren found good descriptions of the Church of England and other people around them. Now the two areas of doctrine where the brethren movement, well I think the brethren movement diverged most from their, uh, most obviously from their reformed Protestant and moderately Calvinistic and Puritan heritage. There's a um, there's a bit of condensing that I did earlier on today. <laughs> was in the areas of ecclesiology, what is the church, and the area of eschatology, what about the last things or the end times. Um, okay, so let's look at those things now. Brethren, ecclesiology is based on the single and simple, complete rejection of all formal organised ministry. Such ecclesiology could be described as an extreme democracy uh, whereby anyone in theory could preach. No one should lead the meeting at all. It should not be led at all except by the spontaneous response to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thus the meetings should be free from any type of formal authority. They should be free from any kind of clergy to divine. And instead the brethren would look only to Christ as their head and the Holy Spirit as their guide. They rejected this idea of clerical order and they were influenced by Luther and his idea of priesthood of all believers, which was combined with an underlying sense that the established clergy had become complacent and corrupt. So the early brethren developed a democratic, free, ecclesiology and they developed it into a coherent doctrinal system which is sometimes referred to as an impulsive theory of ministry, an impulsive theory of ministry whereby the head of the church, that's Christ, exercises authority over this particular meeting through the direct impulsive movement of the spirit upon all members of the church and their willingness to respond to those impulses. 
rather than through authority delegated to human clergy. So the impulsive theory of ministry. The doctrine of separation, the ecclesiastical doctrine of separation, is again undoubtedly one of the most single important doctrines that has defined the movement, maybe not within the movement, but within the eyes of other Christians over the course of brevel history. In essence, it's a sectarian doctrine, and again, I don't mean that in a value sense of being bad, but in a cutting off sense that postulates that the true believers must be separate from the world and all of its impurity. Perhaps this is why today, um, if we were back, if if we were waiting for Scotland to vote uh, today, but we were living 200 years ago, the brethren wouldn't vote in Scotland because they're not citizens of this world. They don't belong to this world. They're just passing through this world. They must be separate from this world and all of its impurity because the brethren believe that evil and heresy has a contaminating effect. It sticks like dirt to the believer's soul. It corrupts. And so the early brethren leaders believed their mission was to call out Christians from the world, to call out churches of Christians from the churches who were under imminent judgment. And I argue extensively in my, in my forthcoming work that the words come out of my people are the key to understanding brethren, ecclesiology and eschatology. That those, those words from Revelation 18 for that Paul of Babylon come out of my people that you be not partakers of her sins. It's a, key, it's a key idea in defining the movement, ecclesiology. So this kind of sectarian teaching, you know, it's common in all sectarian groups, all groups that, you know, whether it's all the different Baptist groups that come out of the Baptist, particular Baptist and strict Baptist and all that kind of thing, or whether it's, it's all the groups that come out of Methodism through the holiness movement, venture into Pentecostalism, or, or whatever, um, it's common, but, but I think it's taken to extreme circles in Brethrenism through the suggestion that there's impure doctrine, impure teaching, and it has some kind of contaminating effect, some kind of germ-like effect that, that can be caught like a cold and can defile the true believer. Darby developed this doctrine of contamination, the idea of evil being transferred like a miasma, miasmatically, from, from not just from from the corrupt churches like Anglicanism to the Brethren Assemblies, not just from one Brethren Assembly to another Brethren Assembly, but from you to you, the person sat next to you, if you weren't careful. It was in part a reaction to what he deems heretical teaching, and it was this doctrine that played a key role in the first significant split between open Brethren many of which the congregations went on to form um, evangelical congregations, as we know them today, and the exclusive division in 1846. And again, it was the language of the apocalypse that gave divine credence to these theories. So we have an early Brethren member, a great guy, Anthony Norris Groves, who wrote in a letter in 18... He was a pioneer missionary to Baghdad. Really a holy guy, godly guy, and in 1836 he wrote to Derby to say that he perceived a change in emphasis from those early days in Fitzwilliam Square in 1829. Remember that ideal that we started off with? Mm -hmm. And there's become an emphasis from that to an emphasis on church order and separating oneself from error. And Groves wanted Derby. Who would have been sat next to him on a Sunday at one point? You will be known more by what you witness against than what you witness for. And practically this will prove that you witness against all but yourself. And I find that quite sad. <clears throat> However, as the rift between the moderate yet still conservative open brethren movement and Darby's more extreme and fundamentalist exclusive brethren movement, um, it, the rift began to increase, Darby became increasingly suspicious 
of all outside his own circle. He became, as uh, one historian has noted, morbidly preoccupied with the evil and worldliness around him. But I would add to that, he became morbidly preoccupied with the evil and worldliness within. And he used this idea of, of Babylon, of come out as a series of concentric circles, starting with the extreme world, the world, this something we need to come out of. And of course, he picks up on the reformers of the Catholic Church as being like Babylon, corrupt, corrupt and fleshly. But then, all of the Christian denominations, the closer outsider becomes seen as Babylon, which we need to come out of, as he did himself when he designed his curacy. But then all of a sudden, the person next to you could be Babylon if they hold on to the corrupt or heretical teaching. So purity was not only sought through adopting an extramural stance, an outside of the wall stance regarding the whole world, but care must be given intramurals within the walls, within the denomination, vis-a-vis -vis the broadest sense of the brethren movement, not to be contaminated by this heretical doctrine from other brethren within, even exemplary people like A. M. Groves. And so the excommunication program begins with Newton's teaching in the Plymouth Assembly, perceived as heretical in the area of Christological doctrine, although as we noticed before it was a nuance a nuanced difference that's gone on uh, since the earliest days of theological discussion, Antioch and Alexandria. Newton was excommunicated in 1847 from Doctrine and and this event set a precedent because from that point onwards, anyone, any individual perceived to not adhere to brethren doctrine would be put out of fellowship. Moreover, any congregation that then received that person would be excommunicated because they would be seen as being miasmatically like germ warfare contaminated by the contagious and toxic teaching. Which is why um, in some assemblies you need to bring a letter uh, from if you move city. For Derby, uh, brevity historian by code notes. Heresy was a real and evil thing. It was a real thing. It worked secretly and deviously beneath the surface until it broke out in its full development, the ruin of a church. It was a subtle and hidden evil. Whole fellowships could be excommunicated. Separation from evil takes on a new dimension within the brethren that's missing from other sectarian movements at the time. So the sectarian movements, up until that point, Sakare broke away from their groups over issues of who was in charge, over issues of doctrine. Can you see how this is slightly different? This is about contamination, about being contaminated by the germ of heresy, um, by the deluded <coughs> over. Okay, let's look now at eschatology. Have we got a separate slide for that? No, no. How you would do that's it. Eschatology, the study of the last things and the end times. Actually, um, may I just yeah. pose a question? Yeah. You've talked a lot about men, and you also spoke about the <coughs> priesthood of all believers. Mm. What was the role of women in these assemblies? Yeah, a great question. Um, now, I think in many ways, the role of women mirrored the role of women in Victorian society. Uh, even today, women have to cover their heads um, in brethren assemblies, even in the open ones. Um, and, and women are not allowed to teach men, but they do great jobs teaching Sunday school. And I believe one of the reasons I stand here is because of my um, brethren Sunday school teaching. We went to a church of England church, but we went to a brethren Sunday school. So we got two lots of um, um, That being said, uh, we have ladies uh, like Lady Theodosia Pauscott, um, who, whose letters and papers uh, were very, and whose conferences that she held influenced uh, brethren eschatology and, and prophecy um, a great deal. But, but widely, I think, I think it would be unfair to say Brethren, it's all about men, um, women's rights, yeah. Because actually, it was just mirroring 
wider society at the time. So it wasn't the priesthood of all believers? Well, only if you understand the priesthood of all believers being that the priesthood of that role is to lead within a church. So, for example, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said to a lady once who said, I believe, called to ministry, she said, he said, how many children have you got at home? There you go. You know, be, that's your primary place of priesthood. And he was, he was prominent Victorian as well. So I think priest, priesthood, in terms of priesthood, in the sense that we stand before God and we don't need another mediator rather than a person who's been to theological college and got a plastic in the comma. Thank you for that question. Very helpful. Okay, let's look at some eschatology. Um, are we doing a time? What time do I start? We're, we're in your hands, James, we're fine. I mean, we, we can go 45 minutes off. Now, I'll uh, wrap it up in about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, eschatology. Now, the brethren have always the study of the end times, eschaton, meaning the end uh, in Greek. Uh, the brethren have always been interested in the end times, in the book of Revelation, in prophecy, in prophetic texts, in apocalyptic things. Indeed, obsessively so. And here we, uh, we, we get back to Charles Haddon's uh, humorous little corruption of Acts 1 and 11. You men are from the by stand ye gazing into heaven. The brethren were so concerned with understanding prophetic and apocalyptic scripture. But unlike many Protestant groups at the time, so we have the Irvingites. We have other groups who are equally, if not more, obsessed with the apocalypse at the time. Um, most groups at the time, um, now let's start with the brethren. The brethren were futurists. Okay, futurists. What this means is, um, in a very brief nutshell, is that from Revelation chapter 4.1, which is the things which must happen hereafter, through to the end, it's projected into the future. Whereas most Protestants... In fact, there's a long history of this. Had a historicist of church historical understanding of Revelation, where Revelation was a roadmap of the entire of world history. So, for example, you could work out where you stood in the book of Revelation, because if you were white and you saw, well, yesterday that happened, and that must have been Revelation chapter 12 and the, the uh, Great Red Dragon. But then you think, uh, and today that's Babylon. You know, the city of London messing up everyone's money. That's that's chapter seven, eighteen. Okay, so actually that means chapter nineteen must happen tomorrow. Well, the brethren actually they were futurists. They, although it was an inaugurated futurism, it had already begun to take place. It was a partially realised futurism. It had begun now. They still projected much of the text into an age to come, and that was radical because. That's not what Protestants did. That's what the Catholics did. In fact, that idea of interpretation dates back to the 16th century and the Catholic counter reformation and Ribera. You see, because if the Protestants are saying uh, the Catholic Church Babylon, the Pope's the Antichrist, and then and then because they're using the historicist view of looking at Revelation, but if you say no, it's all in the future, suddenly you've taken the Revelation out of the hand of those who want to use it to bash the Popes of Rome. So, and also the, the Anglo-Catholic Tractarian movement that was started at the exact same time, uh, they were futurists in their readings. So it's quite a radical thing to project some stuff into the future. Um, it was brave stuff. Now, what else? They were also pre-millennial, pre-millennial. The group believed in the literal second coming of Jesus before, pre, before the millennium, before the tribulation, the terrible stuff that the book of Revelation talks about, and before the thousand year rule of Christ. That's important, because if you believe that Jesus is coming back before everything gets worse, then there's not much point in going out and doing social action. Because the world's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. There's nothing you can do about it. And one day, we're going to disappear and then it's going to be a tribulation. You see how that affects how people... Now, interestingly enough, you've still got George Mueller, the uh, founder of one of the first orphanages, and Dr. Bernardo, being prominent early brethren. Um, but the, the most novel 
bit of their eschatology of the end times was uh, how they were responsible for not inventing, although some people, in fact a number of people say they invented this, but I don't think they did, they just popularised it in a massive way, what was known as the secret rapture of the saints doctrine, the secret rapture doctrine, the secret rapture doctrine, that the true believers will secretly be raptured and leave the earth before the tribulational events of the book of Revelation. And then the book true believers will come back with Christ at another coming and inaugurate his millennial kingdom. Here's a bit more of a nuanced argument. So the brethren postulated that actually the return of Christ took part in two stages. The first stage they called the Epiphania, of the appearing of Christ. Now that was a secret, and only the brethren would see it, the true believers would see it. They would then at that point of the Epiphania, Epiphania the first of the second comings, be raptured and taken up to meet the Lord in the sky, where they would remain for a time, times a half time. Maybe that's 1,260 days. Or maybe it's not literal. But, um, at which point there would be another second coming, the Perusia, which every eye would see. And the key thing is, it was during that gap between the Perusia and the, Epiph the Epiphania and the Perusia that all that bad stuff in the book of Revelation happens. Yeah? So it's, uh, it's the ultimate outworking of eight, Revelation 18.4. I've come out of my people, I've come out of the world, I've come out of the Church of England. I've even come out of that dodgy group in Plymouth, you by Newton, and now I'm coming out all together to meet the Lord in the sky. And the doctrine is fundamental to North American rapture culture. In fact, on the 3rd of October, so what, in a few weeks, a £60 million pound film called Left Behind, starring Nicholas Cage, is going to be released. And there's a direct line to these people and their meeting in 1829 that I talked to you about and that film coming out. Rapture culture is a big money spinner. Um, I've got some stuff about how Kelly influenced um, famous American theologians, um, but I want to talk about dispensationalism. And then I've finished there. I think the most lasting and enduring legacy of Darby's complex of Jesus, eschatology, is his popularization of a dispensational theory. And basically, um, he borrows from a Calabrian monk in the 12th century called Joachim Fiore. And what he does is he splits up the history of the world into epochs or eras or dispensations. And salvation is different in each epoch and era. And that's a really important way of reading scripture because the key to understanding scripture is to remember which epoch or era you're reading it in and which epoch or era it will be fulfilled in. Uh, Darby spoke of the great panthesis, the great pair of brackets of how um, we were in a, he was in a time devoid of prophetic fulfillment at that time because all that stuff was in another set of brackets, another dispensation. And so the key to understanding scripture, the key to understanding the whole world, is to work out which dispensation we're in. Um, okay, so I've just I've just given you some key dates of the schism of sectarianism. Um, most books on the brethren just gets bogged down in this. It's all about this stuff. It's not about the doctrine. It's not about the relationships, it's about, it's about this stuff. Uh, and it becomes, very history becomes little other than a caricature list of schisms. Um, but we arrive at 1900. The book of Revelation has been used much to define the movement and its distinctive theology. I'll leave us with a quote from a brethren historian called uh, W. Glenn Eby. He says, what began with the principle of universal communion ended with universalized communication. 
And um, in one sense, it's a sad note to finish on. It's true but sad, and a word of warning to all of us, in a sense. Uh, but think back to those glorious days of 1829 in Night Victorian Square, and those ideals, and how different things got in the way. Uh, not just personality, although there was personality there, but also doctrine. What people believed got in the way. That's why it matters. Um, but I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, loads there to get our teeth into, and we already have one or two um, beginnings of questions, and I'm sure we can turn to them. And let's really make good use of the fact that, that James is with us tonight. Um, there'll be some really good things to, to perhaps even press you on, and I'm sure you'll rise to the challenge. Um, one of the things I was wondering, with the, the previous Tamara Ideas, there was a, a bread in church and they, the room had a head start and everything. We always said, oh, we have a bread. And I'm suddenly wondering whether that was a, a, not really what we should have called them. Could there be Plymouth bread yeah. or were they brethren of another kind? Well, well what you thanks, Edward. What you find is that um, a, a sociologist of religion might or might not have called this group of Plymouth brethren. And that depends whether they followed that trajectory from the 1846 open exclusive split. And the particular trajectory said that then they didn't go off down the dark, they went down the dark eye route rather than the Kelly eye route. Um, they would not call themselves the Plymouth Brethren. In fact, they would be unlikely to call themselves the Brethren. Because uh, many modern contemporary Brethren congregations and chapters don't like that name. And Plymouth Brethren um, kind of s sticks. It's a bit like, you know, do, do we call ourselves Church of England? Well, on one sense, we are Church of England, but actually there's a much bigger Anglican community that we're part of, and there's a much bigger Christian community we're part of. And actually, but you can sometimes tell from the headscarf, particularly the colour of the headscarf, navy uh, which navy, navy blue navy is often the, the Taylorite, the Taylorite faction of Brethren. Um, there was a, a, a particular impulsive kind of word from God to um, to Taylor um, about about this this colour about the new man this colour. Let's open the floor. <laughs> and stuff on Book of Revelation as well. You know, Brevet and Revelation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So you mentioned that the point we got. Um, lots of um, people being excommunicated for heresy and teaching or whatever. Was it all down to what Darby said was correct or not? Or were other people saying, no, this isn't in line with our standard teaching? Or was it because he had a particular point of view that more people held to, you know, what determined that something was a heresy and someone got excommunicated? Yeah, well, I think, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a particular and a, gen <coughs> and a general answer to that. And I think so within a particular congregation, it would be if a person had a view that was divergent of the prominent uh, person in that congregation, the consensus in that congregation. That's a more particular view. In those early days, if you adhered to Newton's beliefs, or followed Newton, you were a heretic. Yeah. Um, on a wider level, I think, I think it's important to remember that I think um, there's this interplay, this tension between the brethren on one hand being completely independent, each congregation being completely independent, yet each congregation being undoubtedly influenced by, uh, by prolific publications from prominent brethren authors. So, so the, an the answer is both um, Darby and Kelly, even to today. In, in that sense, but it's also what the individual group decide. And, it, and it's interesting, if, if you want to find that out, um, those more open brethren, or those that trace their roots from more open brethren, or from Newton, um, like many evangelical churches, will have the most prominent thing in their, on their website, on their literature, is the doctrinal statement, but see what it starts off with. Because some will start with things like you believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ rather than something about the salvation of Scripture mm -hmm. or God. 
uh, things that uh, things that are kind of important but don't hit that prime level of importance that gets into like the, the nice and creed that all Christians are going through on. If I could go back to my <coughs> earlier yes. question. Yeah. Um, the whole question of um, uh, how new leaders crop up or the next generation or whatever, um, is it something where somebody um, comes out, as it were, um, spontaneously, or are people selected in some way? Well, 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 well the answer to how new leaders emerge, it's actually both. It's from within and from without. So, for example, at William Trotter, the auctionman, he was a, a gifted um, Methodist preacher and minister. And uh, so, um, and, and, um, and so through his giftings, he became prominent within the brethren. Um, and, and then there would be key brethren uh, leaders that, that had no formal theological education. Um, but through their giftedness and through their personalities would have been able to be seen as key or prominent. But let's not forget, no one should be seen as key or prominent. So in a sense, if you, for example, perhaps I, I'm the new person that's ri rising up and I can um, um, engage everyone with a fiery sermon, um, um, I, sh I, don't, I wouldn't leave that church, it don't need Christ. And I wouldn't leave the service, it would be the Holy Spirit. And if you thought it was me, well then actually, um, that's, that's a heretical teaching in a sense. Yet people did rise up. So uh, we talk, I mentioned before C.H. Uh, uh, McIntosh, who, uh, who went around North America popularizing Darby um, theology, and particularly the dispensational stuff and the rapture stuff and the secret rapture stuff, that two-stage secret rapture stuff. Um, and, and, and still there are uh, leaders of congregations today because they take on a name, they're you know, the Lowites, they're the Taylorites, but all that stuff goes against that core principle of brethren ecclesiology. In a sense, it's an error to, for us to talk about that. And, and whilst it happens in reality, it would probably be rejected if we push it. Mm. So there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of paradox there. Mm. Did you want to talk about wider Victorianism? Can I ask the question? Mm. I suppose because. I'm very conscious of the context in which any thought or movement arises. Nothing happens in isolation. You always find when you start to look at people, all these filaments in and out. And here you have a set of people. Um, I find myself thinking their social and cultural background is very powerful. These were confident men. They were not men who, who were going to be nervous. I mean, Nelson's godson. Look at that face. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that is a face that could be a Victorian workhouse master mm -hmm. or a general. Yeah. But what? Commitable. <laughs> you know, immensely poor, these were confident men from a certain social culture. Um, a Victorian educated culture. They had grown up, you could argue, in a very self confident way. <coughs> they were in Ireland, which was deliberately, politically deprived by English society. Mm. The Church of Ireland may have colluded in this. The Roman Catholic Church didn't really think about it. So they saw terrible things. From a profound Christian conviction, surely this must affect how you see these representatives of faith. Um, and I find that really interesting because I think your description of their initial desire to live this faith, irrespective of all this stuff, is not dissimilar to, to John Wesley looking to the dispossessed, except they weren't doing it so consciously, they were coming from a different place. 
but it just strikes me there's something going on there, and I can't. Again, again, there's a paradox there, and and uh, so not all of them were Irish, no, they and, weren't. and and so we got some stuff happening were, in the southwest as well. Irish and, and there was a very strong Irish influence, and there's a very interesting book by Garrett called Respectable Folly, and 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 I think you're right, um, because when we think about people that are sociologically likely to reject the authority of the church and to gaze heavenwards and long for a better world to come. We think of, uh, we think of people who are downtrodden in society and who the world's given a hard hand to. Yet, um, yet that wasn't the case here. And, and interestingly enough, you know, um, they used to meet uh, Lady Pow uh, Theodosia Powercourt's uh, mansion in Grey and discuss, they had these great conferences discussing when the world would end and who was the Antichrist and uh, the man of sin and the apostasy and Babylon and all this stuff um, amidst this most spectacular um, wealthy uh, backdrop, you know, um, the, the largest waterfall in, in Ireland pouring through the ground um, and, and they would come out with things like there can be no amelioration of the state of the world. You know, they've given up on that idea in a sense that they could make the world better on that level. Yet you've got people like George Mueller, Dr. Banana, arguably excommunicated and on the more open side, but people that left a great legacy. Um, and I think that way that, I think, I think there's no particular answer, but I think what, what you've highlighted is a fascinating question and it's the way that people and scriptures interact between contexts. And we mustn't forget that when we read scripture, that we read it in a context, and the context affects how we read it. Um, and I think, I think you've highlighted that there. Um, I find it absolutely <coughs> was the other question I find myself asking, making me wonder, what do their wives make? <laughs> Just that, you know, what were their, what were their, how did their families actually Of course, um, Darby was going to marry Lady Pascal, even though she wasn't present, uh, but didn't. Um, I mean, they, yeah, they, 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 they write to things like this, you know, um, I, mean, I don't believe Darby married, um, although I might be wrong on that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I wonder, I wonder what um, if that would have been different or similar to um, to what was happening in wider society. Was it was it, was it just a mirror of wider society? On this topic, uh, where I got my dates from, wasn't it 1827 when the Test Acts were repealed? And uh, is it 1823 when the Act of Uniformity were got rid of? In other words, the Church of England had maintained this sinister control, church and state, one and the same thing. You either get fined if you don't turn up. There's no freedom of thought. And suddenly, the, these two things are like taking a cork out of a bottle. Yeah. And people are moving into what we regard as, has it ever been other that we can think what we like? Now we are feeling a little pressure. Uh, and on the women topic, uh, and I said from a, uh, a background of experience, what used to be said on occasion was, he may be the head, but I'm the neck. <laughs> <laughs> now, that wasn't preached, but it was said as the, you know, in, in other words, as in all organizations, in all places, women uh, had a giftedness and an ability uh, and it was a question of how, within their judgment, they could best organise it. I mean, they they had they had uh, women's meetings. Most uh, lots of missionaries were women. Yes. Yeah. But I find that sad actually, because oh, yeah, no, I'm because not, I'm not yeah. no, no, but I'm but sad. I just want to pick up on that of, 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 of being a missionary, and it happens today. There's some wonderful missionaries out there, women, for everyone. And they're there because I've met them in a number of different countries and continents because 
they have a gift of calling, but they can't exercise it in their local congregation because they're women, so they have to go to the other side of the world to do it. But I mean, at the same time as the question that was asked here, that was exactly the same in any other denomination. There was no, no denomination that said, you know, priesthood of all believers, let women talk amongst men and let them hold positions in, in office. It's, it's a modern uh, appearance, isn't it? We've got a few, so, we've got yeah. one or two other hands public. Um, Brian, yes. something about the state of the movement in this country today? Yeah, um, well, again, you know, to, to say that, um, that the movement would, would, in part, deny that it is a movement. There are still many places where you'll find a Brethren Chapel. Um, some of the places they are there more now in the world. Well, I can tell. I can tell. I can tell you that in 1845 there was around about 7,500 people that called themselves brethren, um, and I can tell you that um, there was probably more because on the census and in religious census of England and Wales on that day, uh, three separate services during that day. Lots of people um, complained about the name church uh, or, you know, or the word brethren. Um, the backdrop of that is that there was 5 million Anglicans went to church that day, but 5.5 million people that didn't go to church. Whether there's more today or not, I mean, I presume, I presume there are. I mean, there's certainly brethren churches in all country, in all country of the world for their missionary activity. Um, the question is whether, um, I think, <coughs> where, what, what strain they came from. Um, and I think there are a number of churches that sociologically, sociologists of religion would say brethren, but would actually say well, just evangelical. It's, very, it's difficult, I think. It's difficult because of the fact that brethren don't like, a lot of brethren don't like the term brethren or the term church. But supposing I wanted to become a, a member of a, a fellowship that isn't brethren, that we call brethren, um, and I pitched up one day, and they're going to say, hang on a minute, you can't come in, it's dangerous. They'd be very suspicious, you wouldn't be yeah. better. So, yeah. so um, I mean, we spend all our time agonising over how we can be more welcoming, and, you know, improving the coffee and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> we just have a sense that a brethren fellowship is all about keeping people out, keeping themselves so safe. How I mean, are you getting it? Yeah. 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 How, yeah. How do, I've been part yeah. of two Brethren churches in my time, and I have no letter in either one. So no, so rules, yeah, but no, but sure. that depends. That depends the type of brethren, and I was very careful to say um, to say that some brethren. So, for example, when I was university chaplain, um, someone from a brethren church in Kerala came with a letter from the pastor. Um, it depends on the type of brethren church, as we as we've seen that it is it's, it, it's an amorphous umbrella term, and it almost doesn't exist as a thing. Only on a sociological level. Um, and I just want to people think that you couldn't go and join such a setup because they're right, right. definitely as well But I don't think they call. I don't think they'd officially call if, uh, call themselves brethren, or at least they'd struggle with they'd struggle with that. <laughs> Question from Chris. Yeah, um, you were talking about the, you call the the impulsive theory of ministry, the idea that the community um, and its worship are led by the Spirit. At the same time, uh, I got the impression that the early brethren, certainly brethren today, or whatever they might be called, um, are pretty suspicious of um, what became Pentecostalism, yeah. charismatic gifts, uh, unlike some Methodists or the Irvingites in their time. Um, I, I wonder if you could elucidate that a bit, because it seems to be a bit, uh, bit paradoxical. Yeah, it? yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So, so the brethren have an impulsive theory of ministry, but it's still within a very conservative, socially conservative and theological conservative paradigm. Um, so by that impulsive theory of ministry, it's not like within the Pentecostal churches where someone might stand up and give a word in tongues. Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly enough, I can think of two different congregations in two different parts of the country where things like that have happened and it's caused all sorts of uh, problems because they have to re-question theology. Um, 
but, but by and large, um, I mean, evangelicalism, again, is a difficult word to pin down, but I'd say, I'd say Brevinism is on, on this, this spectrum, of the right spectrum of cons more conservative evangelicalism, whereas the Pentecostal and charismatic evangelicalism tends to be on the more open side, because liberals won't like the word for it, because it's not theologically liberal. Does that, does that help? So the, 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 I mean, that, that more seraphal, intellectual yeah. miracle. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Trigella was one of the early brethren that we could have talked about. He, he was, and still is, um, um, a world Hebrew Chaldean scholar. He's a, he's a, his lexicon is still used um, today. We're, we're not talking. We're talking. We're talking incredibly intelligent conservative Victorians. Yes. Question. Um, some years ago, there was um, one or two terrible cases in America of um, great groups of people in the church who thought that the end of the world was coming, and some of them committed suicide. I think on the um, on the instruction. Of, uh, and I was just wondering because they thought that the end of the world was coming, or imminent. Are these sort of, is it exclusive to permit the brethren that they're interested in this end of the world? Well, they're incredibly interested in the end of the world, but they tend not to make predictions like that. Um, you know, so so you've got um, all the famous stuff the Millerites that became Seventh Day Adventists and three separate predictions. And Forties, I think, people saying the houses and that happening, and uh, having to change the theology. But more recently, Harold Camping and his three different predictions uh, for 2012, was it? You know, uh, the brethren don't tend to do that because because people that do that tend to have a historicist timeline reading of Revelation rather than a dispensational reading where it's bracketed out in different epochs and eras and and and, in, and their futures. And the future issue, the albeit inaugurated, it still is, it still is future. It is happening, but it's future. And also, they have two, because they have a two stage rapture, um, it doesn't really matter about you, because we will meet him in the sky, that, that divine, um, heavenly luxury thing that happens up there, while all that bad stuff happens down here. That's not the only. That's not the only view of the rapture. You see, because some people that uh, uh, look into that theory think um, think that tribulation happens before, which is um, and that the rapture is post tribulation. But I mean, I mean, we're back, we're back to the fact that the brethren isn't a thing, and I'm sure that there'll be arguments counter to that. But by and large, the brethren don't try to do it. I'd like to ask a question as to whether in a brethren uh, liturgy or service there's a moment for confession of sin. I mean, what, is it assumed that, that if you're in, you don't need to do that? You know, you're being baptized, you're, being baptized and you're living a holy life, and what's more, we're keeping out all the, all the sinful stuff that could make us sin is kept well away. We don't need to confess our sins anymore. C c confession of, of sin is incredibly important before coming to the Lord's table, um, and it's done. It's done quietly. Um, although but there is a precedent of if someone is um, in sin and not repentant, that it, that they can be taken before uh, in public before um, you know and be made made public, but, but, but that serious soul searching for any slight inkling of sin before coming to lost table is very important. I mean, I don't know what people with particular breathing backgrounds are like, but I uh, have experienced, but I, I would say that that, that, that moment before the whole community of that soul searching is very important to wider and I don't know what and if, and if that's a healing moment, why all the need for the excommunication and all, all of that stuff? Why, why couldn't the danger of sin be handled in a different kind of way? It's, it's my I mean, I think it's contagious. Part of that's part of that.
We're running out of time. But, um, um, but we've had a fascinating evening. I mean, I think, uh, I, I have to confess, I knew very little about um, the, the brethren before this evening. I still know not very much. <laughs> an awful lot more than I did. James, thank you so much. You mentioned once or twice about a book that's coming out. Do you want to end just by telling us what that is? Yeah, um, um, I, I have a book forthcoming on this. It's a big book and it's an academic book. Um, it's uh, 100,000 words and uh, 10 chapters and it's called Babylon and the Brethren and it's published by Whip and Stock and um, um, it won't be very expensive and, and it's a, a bit of it's about the Brethren because really what it's about is the way that people read and use the Book of Revelation in different contexts. That's what it's really about. And the Brethren just happen to be the group of the focus. And uh, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, I'll pass you my email address. And uh, I've tried to push for a 3rd of October release to time for the film, um, but, um, but it might be jam it might be as late as January. Good. Well, I'm sure you'll all rush out and buy in the book. But if you don't, we probably will get a copy for the Courtyard Library, which you're always welcome to come and use. Thank you again for being here tonight. Don't forget next month, the Church of England with Mark Chapman. Um, but let's thank James again.